Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AV Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. Today we're going to be doing a brief review of a few geopolitical theories that we find in the Political Geography Unit. And I want to go ahead and apologize to Australia for covering you up. Are you guys really nice? So I figured, you know, what the heck, you might be cool with it. So the first thing we need to establish before we get into this are what are geopolitics exactly. Uh, in the modern world that we live in, this idea of geopolitics has become uh, much more important, especially when we talk about globalization and states interacting with each other. So the definition, and you can know that I'm being serious because I brought up the dictionary, is the study of how geography and economics have influence on politics and the relations between nations. Now you notice in this particular definition they use the word nations. In our, co in our course, we'll want to use the word states. Uh, so really what we're looking at is the politics that are created between states and the way that geography especially is going to play a role in the different relationships that states have between one another. In the course, uh, there are we cover three geopolitical theories. So these are theories about geopolitics and uh, theories that states are going to follow when it is uh, when they're trying to establish how it is that they're going to relate and how it is that they're going to interact with one another. Uh, so these are different theories about geopolitics. They're also going to help states create foreign policy, uh, figure out their diplomacy that they're going to have between various countries, what uh, particular strategies they may want to follow as they interact with each other or get involved or don't get involved in particular areas of the world. Uh, so today we're just going to be covering three uh, geopolitical theories that we find in the course. Uh, the well, first one we're going to look at is what's called the organic theory, then we're going to look at the heartland theory, and also the rimland theory. You'll notice that these theories are not in chronological order. Uh, and that is because the heartland and the rimland theory really go together as a topic uh, where the organic theory is a little bit separate. So the first theory that we're going to look at is what's called the organic theory. The orga organic theory was developed by a man by the name of Friedrich Ratzel in the 1940s and uh, he was a German uh, geopolitician and this is important because uh, this is of course the, er the time when uh, Adolf Hitler was in control in Germany, World War II had started, uh, and it helps us to understand some of the moves that the Germans had made uh, leading up to World War II. If you also understand the context of history, this is uh, a time period when uh, the idea of social Darwinism was real, uh, was real big, uh, the idea of certain societies and civilizations being superior to others, also uh, the idea that we, we begin to see the emergence of the scientific studies uh, not just of the physical world, but also of the kind of the human world and human institutions and organiz uh, organizations, and things along those lines. This is when we begin to see the studies of, uh, of, of sociology, of psychology, anthropology, geography, all these things, uh, and, and people believe that we can approach it from a scientific perspective. Uh, and so that's going to lend itself to the development of this idea of what's called the organic theory. Now, the basic premise uh, behind Friedrich Ratzel's idea is that States are like states are living organisms, and as a result of them being living organisms, they're going to need nourishment in order to continue to thrive and to survive. And again, you have to kind of understand the context of social Darwinism and this idea that some peoples and some civilizations are superior to others, and in order to show their superiority, uh, many times they're going to try and dominate or, uh, over others. Also bring in the context of the idea of the survival of the fittest. And so if states do not go out and dominate other states, then they in turn will then be dominated. And so they need to show their superiority by going out and dominating others, gaining territory and land and resources, uh, not only for themselves, but also for their people. Now, where, this, uh, where you see this play out, of course, again, is leading up to World War II, uh, what Hitler did, or what Hitler bought into, is this idea of Lebensraum, and what that means translated is living space. Uh, and so what Hitler said was that the people of Germany needed extra living space in order to, uh, in order to survive and in order to thrive. And so that is why he goes into some of the neighboring countries and surrounding territories, and he begins to incorporate those territories into, uh, into Germany. Um, and, and also you see that process of irredentism taking place as well when he begins to uh, invade uh, portions of, uh, you know, he, of course he invades the Rhineland uh, here in western portions of Germany and then uh, Austria as well as uh, Czechoslovakia and then of course eventually, uh, eventually Poland. And of course it's this particular theory that is eventually going to lead us into World War II. 
The next theory that we're going to look at is what's called the Heartland Theory. Now you'll notice the Heartland Theory uh, was developed uh, prior to the Organic Theory. And this is more of a theory of global domination and global power. It was developed by a British man uh, by the name of Harlford Mackinder. And uh, one of the things that makes him different from some of his contemporaries is he believed, he believed in this idea of pivot areas, but also pivot points in history. And he believed that up to the point that he was, that he was looking at, uh, the most dominant powers in the world had been naval-based powers. And he believed that they were at a pivot point in history where eventually you're going to see a transition into a point where uh, you're primarily going to have land-based powers uh, being the most powerful countries in the world. And so if you looked at the world and you kind of take a worldwide, you took a, a worldwide view of things, uh, he wanted to see which areas would be necessary in order to create kind of this global power. And then, of course, the idea would then be to prevent uh, countries from becoming global powers that would then uh, dominate Britain. And, of course, this is a big deal to Britain because uh, Britain was the, uh, the, naval, uh, the naval superpower during that particular time. So what he identified... Uh, was this place in uh, in Eurasia, so uh, the eastern portions of Europe, and then uh, you know the majority of northern and central Asia, as what he considered to be the heartland. Now the heartland was this place that he did not feel like could be defeated because he saw it as this what he called a land fortress. Now this was prior to the time uh, of the use of, or at least the 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 effective use of tanks, but also the effective use of air forces, and so this idea of a large impenetrable land fortress that could not be defeated um, because of course you could you would have a huge buffer between yourself and any military that might be uh, might be trying to invade and so he believed that if any one country or any one kingdom had control over this particular territory then they would not be able to be uh, defeated now not only did it provide a tremendous amount of space to uh, to buffer yourself against um, against invaders uh, but also it has has an abundance of resources uh, in the eastern portion of uh, this heartland, so east of the Urals, you have a tremendous amount of mineral resources, natural gas and oil. Uh, and to the western portion, especially if you're moving into Poland and Ukraine, uh, you have a tremendous amount of fertile soil that you're able to grow, uh, grow crops on to feed your population, things along those lines. Uh, and so he believed that this heartland space would be kind of the key to global power, global domination. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, at this time, the, uh, the the country or the kingdom that controlled most of this territory uh, was Russia, and so that helps to kind of see, uh, you know, the reasons why the English were a little bit leery of Russia uh, moving into World War One, um, and and also uh, some of their other interactions they had there in Europe. <laughs> The next theory that we're going to look at is what's called the Rimland Theory. Now the Rimland Theory plays off of the Heartland Theory, and that's why I have those two kind of uh, one right after the other. The Rimland Theory was developed by an American named Nicholas Spikeman. Now when he looked at the Heartland, he, he agreed with Harl from McKinder that the Heartland was, was a key kind of pivotal area, but what he thought was uh, that the Rimland was more important than the Heartland in terms of uh, global domination in, in terms of global power, and the reason for that is, and if you again, if you know anything about history, especially Russian history, uh, one of the things the heartland lacks is uh, opening to a warm water port uh, year round, and of course that's what the the Russians had constantly been trying to get at, uh, you know, especially to the west to in, interact with the uh, the Europeans, uh, and so with that warm water port, what it allows for is it allows uh, it allows whoever controls that space to interact with other countries, to trade with them, to uh, develop uh, new innovations and technologies that they may uh, may incorporate based upon those particular uh, those particular uh, interactions. And so, if you were able to control both the Rimland and the Heartland, this is what Spikeman thought would be kind of the uh, you know the the place that that could not be defeated, kind of this global superpower. Uh, that nobody would be able to defeat, and so uh, you know that's that's going to help you to understand a little bit better some of the foreign policy objectives that the Americans have as we move forward into the 20th century. Now, kind of my my take on this is well, you know, you look at the heartland and the rimland. Well, of course, duh. I mean, you control you know what like three quarters of the world population. You know, probably you know half more than half of the world's land area. Then it seems stands to reason that. This might be one of the most powerful countries in the world, uh, but you know who am I? Who am I to make those kinds of judgments? 
Um, so we we look at the Rimland, and he uses the Rimland and this idea of the Rimland to explain the rise of Japan. And we also use this idea of Rimland to understand again American foreign policy moving into especially the Cold War. Because if you think of uh, the places where there were issues and conflict right after World War II, uh, first we had Korea. Uh, first conflict was in Korea, then it was uh, in Vietnam, which is behind my head, uh, and you also had a conflict in Afghanistan. Okay, and you notice that all of those are in the Rimland area, and so this kind of flows into that notion of containment. Also, if you're familiar with Marxist uh, ideology, then you then you be you're aware of this idea of kind of the global uh, revolution of the proletariat, and that's the idea that Marx was trying to create: is that there would be a worldwide class consciousness. And then uh, eventually all the proletariat would rise up and uh, and overthrow the bourgeois. And so there's the concern of, of you know the development of Marxism. Uh, China had fallen to communism. There was communist tendencies in uh, in India. You know, much of Eastern Europe had fallen under the Iron Curtain, things like that. And so that was a real concern for the Americans. So uh, we begin to understand a little bit better American foreign policy during the period of the Cold War if we take into consideration the Rimland theory. So now we're just going to do a brief recap of the different uh, geopolitical theories we've looked at. Again, first we have the organic theory developed by the German Friedrich Ratzel, this idea that states are living organisms. The idea that states are living organisms and they need resources to survive helps us to understand the invasions of countries prior to World War II. Uh, you have the Heartland Theory by Harlford Mackinder, the British man uh, who believed that there was this, uh, this land fortress that existed in, uh, in Eurasia, Central Eurasia, which incorporated most of the Russian Empire. Then you have the Rimland theory, which is this idea by Nicholas Spikeman, uh, who believed that not just the heartland, but you also needed the Rimland. And let me get myself out of the way here so that you can see that. Uh, not only the heartland, but the Rimland was also important uh, to, uh, to understanding kind of global dominance. And this helps you to understand some of the foreign policy objectives and the things the Americans did during the Cold War in order to check uh, Russian or Soviet expansion uh, during that particular period. So anyway, those are the three different geopolitical theories that we find within the Human Geography course. I hope you found that to be helpful, and as always, I hope to see you next time.